Good morning, and God bless each and every one of you, and a blessed new year. And we are so thankful to be here this morning on this glorious Lord's Day, the very first Lord's Day of 2022. God bless you, and welcome to Spirit of New Ministries. All of you who are in the house, all of you who are worshiping with us online, we welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm excited, for God is doing great things, and we are here in a brand new year. And we are expecting to see great things and to do great things for the God of our salvation. Stand as we begin our worship this morning with me as we continue in our worship. Let us consider the word of God this morning. And today we will open our worship with the 111th Psalm, Psalm 111. And we're going to consider the first three verses of Psalm 111. And there we'll be reading from the English Standard Version, Psalm 111, beginning at verse 1. And there you will find these power and powerful and precious words. It says, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. We are so thankful that we serve a God who loves us and a God who we can celebrate with our whole heart because he is worthy, and he is certainly a great and awesome God. Let us now look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning and we are so thankful for this glorious Lord's Day. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to breach a brand new year and to be in the house one with another. Thank you for this day. We pray that all that we do today might be glorious in your sight. We pray that our worship might be pleasing unto you as we now stand in the company of the upright in the congregation of the saints. So, Father, we pray that your spirit would rest with us and allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth. For that, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And it's this prayer that we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. As you were on your feet, why don't you wave to your brother and your sister, let them know how glad you are to see them in this spanking brand new year. And we're thankful to be in the house together, so glad to see each and every one of you. You know, the fact that we're here today is truly demonstrative of God's blessings. The fact that he has kept us through 2021, allowed us to make it into 2022. We are blessed and we are highly favored. And so we ought to give God a praise for that. Truly, he is worthy of our praise and of our thanks. You may be seated, those of you in the house. And again, I'm just so very, very thankful for us being here today. We are of all people, as Paul said, we are most blessed because we are the recipients of the blessings of an all-loving, all-gracious, and all-compassionate God. This morning, I'd like to bring a few things to your attention. We want to keep in very special prayer members of our family here at Spirit Anew who have lost loved ones recently, and we want to remember the family of Elder Tyrone Grinstead who recently Uh, lost a brother. He's here with us this morning, and we certainly want to keep his family in prayer. We received a card of thanks uh, from him and from his family that says that they are so thankful that the Lord made us so thankful for his kindness, too. Thank you, Spirit of New Ministry family, for your thoughts and your prayers with our family as we were going through some tough times. Your kindness helped us through. Blessed is his name, your gift was felt with love, and that was from Elder Tyrone Grinstead and his family, and so we thank you so very, very much. Again, we're keeping Elder Grinstead and his family in prayer. We also want to remember the family 
of Sister Sylvia Moffat, who recently went on to be with the Lord last week. That is the daughter uh, or the mother of Sister Charlene Robinson. And so we want to continue to keep that family in our prayers. We're going to have a homegoing celebration for her this coming Friday, uh, the 7th, at 11 a.m. through 1 p.m. will be a visitation to be held at the New Zion Church. And then at 1 o'clock, we will have a celebration of life for Sister Moffat. And so continue to keep these and other families in your prayers as we are now entering into a new year. And we also want to be mindful that even though we're entering a new year, there are times when we still go through some trials. But we're thankful that we serve an awesome and a loving God in the midst of that. I am also, to, also excited to announce that on the third Sunday of this month, this month of January, uh, the 16th of January, we will be celebrating 19 years here at Spirit of New Ministries, a pastoral and church anniversary. And so we're looking forward to a great time in worship. Please feel free, if you're able, to come and join us on that day again. That is Sunday, January the 16th, the third Sunday of this month. We're going to have a wonderful time in worship as we celebrate God allowing us to be in this area for 19 years of service, ministry, and worship here in this area of Louisville, Kentucky. We are so glad to be able to do that. In doing so, we want to continue to encourage you and to pray for us that we would continue to be a blessing in this community. We want to do all that God has set us here to do, and we are excited, we are thankful, and we're privileged to be here. And so we ask that you would continue to keep us in your prayers. And so, saints, it's time that we worship God through our giving, our tithes, and our offerings. Time to bring our tithes and our offerings to the storehouse, as the Bible says, that there would be meat in my house herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, we bring our tithes, we bring our offerings, our sacrificial giving, so that we can continue to do the great work that God has set for us to do, uh, but also out of our sense of appreciation and thanksgiving for all that God has already done. So let us begin this year with a great gift unto the Lord. Let us make ready our tithes, our offerings, our sacrificial giving, that we would do that which is pleasing in the eyesight of God. And if you would like to give to Spirit of New Ministries, you can do that one of several ways. If you have your device and if you've downloaded the Givelify app, if you've not done so, please feel free to do so, and that is Givelify. And once you go to the Givelify app, you will look for Spirit of New Ministries. And once you've found Spirit of New Ministries, you can follow the prompts for your giving. You can also go to the Givelify website, which is givelify.com. And there again, you will look for Spirit of New Ministries, again, following the prompts for your giving opportunities. And then you can also go to our website, which is spiritanewministries.com. And once you go on our website, you will find the donations tab. If you click on that tab, it will take you to the Givelify tab, and you can follow the prompts there for your giving as well. Again, we are so very thankful for those of you who have supported us uh, throughout the years and those who continue to support us as we continue to do the Lord's work in this community. Let us now look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come this morning and our hearts are glad. We are so excited for the fact that you continue to bless us. Your word tells us that morning by morning new mercies we see because great is your faithfulness. Lord, we want to be faithful unto you through our sacrificial giving, our tithes, and our offerings. So we pray that they would be used for kingdom purpose, that you would be glorified and your people would be edified. Lord, we pray that you would bless the gift as well as the giver, and even that person that may not have the fiscal resources, but Lord, they have the heart's desire to give. We pray that you would open heaven's window and bless them just as well. For all of these things and so much more, we offer our thanks and our praise, and we offer this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And again, God bless you. So good to see each and every one of you on this blessed New Year's morning, this New Year Sunday. We are thankful for the opportunity to enter into worship one with another. It's time now that we worship God through his word. And so we're asking that you would stand as we consider the word of God together. And once you are on your feet, if you have your Bibles or your devices, if you will join me in going to the 32nd Psalm, Psalm 32. And this morning, our passage finds its home in that 32nd Psalm, verses 7 
and 8. A short reading this morning, but very, very powerful for our hearts this morning. Again, Psalm 32, and we will be beginning our reading at verse 7. And I will be reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. Beginning at verse 7, the Word of God declares, You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Psalm 32, verses 7 and 8, and those in the house, you may now be seated. And this morning, I'd like to encourage your hearts, prayerfully excite your soul with the thought, instructions for a blessed new year. Instructions for a blessed new year. How many of us want to have a blessed new year? Come on, let me see by your hands. Amen, amen. All of us, in some way, shape, or form, want to experience God's blessings in this new year, 2022. And what often happens as we make it into a new year, or even just before going into a new year, we tend to make resolutions, we establish objectives that we want to accomplish. We resolve to do certain and sundry things. We may resolve to lose weight, and I know nobody in the house needs to do that this morning. We especially tend to make that kind of resolution after coming on the heels of this festive holiday season, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. Some of us tend to put on what's called that holiday weight. So we make resolutions to try to lose that weight as we go into the new year. We resolve to get more exercise. We resolve to eat better. We resolve to be healthier, to be better, uh, to be better people at large. And so we tend to have these resolutions. And resolutions, for the most part, as people are concerned, really are not a bad thing. But when we really start to look at the components of resolutions, resolutions are really generally fleeting. They are really short-lived, and oftentimes they really don't get the job done. And so even though it's not a bad thing to be resolute in what we want to do, oftentimes resolutions in and of themselves really are short-lived and don't reach the objectives that we like. So if we want to talk about walking in the blessings of God for this new year, or not only in this new year, but in any season of our lives, we need to realize that there are some basic yet significant principles that we need to understand and therefore follow. We need to recognize that blessedness or walking in the blessings of God don't just happen. We don't just stumble on them. They don't just occur by happenstance. But when we talk about walking in the blessing flow of God, and I know everybody in here wants to walk in the blessedness of God, we need to recognize that there are some things that we need to understand, some things that we need to adhere to, and some things that we need to do. And the reason why that's the case is because God, as you well know, and if you don't know, you ought to know that our God really, really loves us. And because he loves us, he gives us divine instructions in order to position us so that we will be able to walk, to move, and to live in the abundant blessings of God. It's God's desire. It's his heart's purpose that we walk in his blessings that we live in his blessings, and that we flow in the blessings of God. But it doesn't happen by accident. There are some very deliberate, very distinct and specific things that we need to do in order to find ourselves walking in the blessing flow of God. 
And that's why when we look at our passage this morning, and we look at this 32nd Psalm, we see that the author, who is David, gives us some very specific information. In all reality, when we look at this 32nd Psalm in its entirety, it reads like a spiritual virtual tutorial on how to walk in the blessing flow of God. So when you look at this 32nd Psalm and you begin at verses 1 and 2, we see how he very methodically, David talks about how to enter in, how to prepare ourselves to enter into the very blessing flow of God. So when you look at Psalm 32 and we consider verses 1 and 2, there it says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And he goes very deliberately into this whole issue of how to be blessed. So the very first thing there, he says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. So he goes right into this issue of transgression. And transgression is just another word for sin. It's another word for unrighteousness. So he said, in order to be blessed, our transgression needs to be forgiven. So what he's talking about is the fact that in order for me to walk in blessedness, I have to deal with the issue of my sin. I can't ignore it. I can't overstep it. I can't decide to just kind of push it off to the side and just because I grace the face of this earth then I'm just going to walk right into God's blessing. Saints, I want to let you know it doesn't work that way. But in order for us to walk in the blessedness of God, we've got to deal with our sin. So he says, blessed is those, or blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And notice what David does, or in essence, what he doesn't do. He doesn't just glaze over this issue, but he calls out transgression and sin for what they are. He said, our transgression needs to be... our." Transgression, transgression needs to be forgiven and our sin needs to be covered. And that's why when he goes into the second verse, he said, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So he deals with this. He brings it to the forefront. He puts it out on the table and he helps us to realize that in God's love for us, it's necessary for us to deal with the very sin nature that all of us bear. Because we were born into sin, we were shapen in iniquity. And all of us were born under the curse of sin that happened in the garden. And because of that, we need to deal with this sin. We need to address it in order for us to be able to walk in our blessedness. And that's why when you go down to the third verse, there David makes this declaration. He says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. In other words, what David is saying is that when I tried to keep quiet about my sin, when I tried to hide my transgressions, when I tried to act as if they were no big deal, he says. When I tried to keep silent, he said his bones wasted away. In other words, there was an internal going to a place where God was not pleased, and therefore there was a wasting away of his very nature of his bones. And he says through his groaning all day long that there was a constant groaning because he did not do the things that were pleasing before God and he did not address his sin. He says it was a bad thing. And then he says in verse 4, he says, For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. And here David goes deep into this. And he talks about how his sin not being addressed was consequential to his well-being. And beloved, I want you to understand that even today, as we celebrate this new year of 2022, we need to realize that our sin must be addressed. 
We can't look at it as if it's no big deal. We can't sweep it under the rug as if it doesn't count. But just like David says, we need to make sure that our sin is recognized and that we address it in a way that honors God and will be a blessing to our lives. Please say amen, somebody. He says we can't ignore it. We can't sweep it away as if it doesn't exist. But in order for us to walk in our blessed season, we absolutely must deal with our sin condition. And that's why here David addresses it in the very first portion of this 32nd chapter. And he says, when I don't address it, when I don't deal with it, when I don't acknowledge it, it's as if my bones are wasting away and the heavy hand of God's consequence is upon me when I don't deal with my sin. And I know that on this brand new year, y'all probably didn't come to hear about sin. Probably didn't come to hear about how sin weighs us down. But I need to say this to you because if we don't address it and we don't deal with it, we continue in the same rut and we allow our sin to have mastery over us. But it's God's purpose that sin does not rule in any of our lives, but the grace and the mercy and the power of God's love and his goodness would reign in our lives each and every day. And that's why we need to recognize how to deal with this issue so we can gain mastery and gain victory. How many want to gain victory over your lives in this brand new year? How many want to walk in the blessedness of God? Because that's God's goal, his purpose, and his desire for each and every one of us. Let us move on because now when we drop down to verse 5, in verse 5, he deals with how we ought to deal with our sin. And in order for us to be able to walk in the blessedness of God, to be able to walk in the blessedness of a new year, of a new season in our lives, there are some very deliberate things that we must realize and must address. Here in the fifth verse of that 32nd Psalm, David says, I acknowledged my sin to you. Now, I'm going to break this verse down because notice he says, I acknowledged my sin. In other words, it's past tense. It's not something that he says, I'm going to do. But he recognizes it as an already accomplished task. He already acknowledged his sin. He did not go into the new season of his life saying, well, God, I'm going to get around to it sometime. I, I'll deal with it uh, next week or next Sunday or, or next month or when I need a blessing, then I'll deal with my sin. No, David says, I've already dealt with my sin. And in order for us to walk in the blessedness of this life in Christ, we need to do business with God. We need to get in our private prayer closet. And we need to shut out everything and everybody, and we need to get on our knees, and we need to do some serious business with God. David says, I'm not going to do it. I've already done it. And so if we've not done it yet, I would encourage us to get to the business of doing some business with God. Let us deal with our sin and not act as if it's not a big deal, because truly it really is really is. And David makes that acknowledgement. He said, I've acknowledged my sin to you. And he's speaking to God. I've acknowledged it. And then he goes on to say in the latter portion of that fifth verse, he said, I did not cover my iniquity. In other words, I didn't try to act like it wasn't there. I didn't try to just sweep it to the side as so many people tend to do. He says, not only did I acknowledge it, but I didn't try to hide it. And I just want to kind of throw this out here parenthetically. How many of us have tried to hide our sins before God? Come on, let's be honest. How many of us have tried to sweep some stuff away or act like it didn't exist or act like it wasn't a big deal or try to play games with God and just say, well, God, I, I want to be blessed. I, I want to walk in the blessing, but I don't really want to deal with my sin because in my eyes, God is really not sin. And so we have to realize that, that God is not to be played with. God is not to be looked at as an eternal genie where we rub the lamp and we just expect blessings to pop out. 
But here we've got to do some serious internal, eternal business that says I've got to deal with my condition. I've got to deal with my sin and I need not cover my transgressions or my iniquity. And when you look at the scripture, when it talks about transgressions, iniquity, sins, all of those are pretty much dealing with the same thing. My unrighteousness before God. And so here he says, I have not done that. I've acknowledged my sins. I've not covered my iniquity. But notice what he says. He says, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. Now, you might look at that and say, well, wait a minute. He did one thing already, but now he's talking about doing something in the future. So here, within the very same context of this passage, we have past tense and we have future tense. And somebody might look at that from an analytical eye and say, well, what is it that, that David is talking about? David is talking about a progressive process. And that process deals with my acknowledgement of my condition before God while at the same time, simultaneously, I am confessing my sin before God. God, I'm acknowledging my wrongdoing while at the same time, I'm confessing. I'm acknowledging and I'm confessing. I'm confessing and I'm acknowledging and I'm recognizing that I need to do business on a consistent basis before my God. Again, say amen, somebody. Here, David is realizing that, and maybe David is having flashbacks. You know how we have flashbacks sometimes? When our mind goes back to those days when we were doing stuff we know we shouldn't have been doing. We knew it was wrong, but we did it anyway. Some of us did it, and because it was so good, we backed up and did it again. Come on, somebody. Maybe David was having flashbacks. Maybe he was thinking about that fine sister he saw called Bathsheba. Oh, y'all remember David when he was up on the rooftop when he should have been in battle? <laughs> when he, and see, sometimes we get ourselves in trouble because we're not where we're supposed to be and we're doing what we're not supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's a new year. <laughs> Praise God. And, and so here, David might have been having a flashback. Maybe he was thinking about that time when he saw Bathsheba and he said, boy, she sure is fine. I think I want to get with that right there. And I'm so thankful that none of us have ever had that kind of scenario. We've always kept it where it needed to be. But here, David recognizes, he said, God, I messed up. I made some mistakes. I've done some things that I know don't please you. And because of that, God, I got to get on my knees and I got to confess. I've got to go before the Lord. I've got to make my sins known. I cannot hide it any longer. And when I do that, notice what he says. He says, and you forgave the iniquities in my sin. Because I acknowledge my wrongdoing, because I went on my knees and I confess, God then forgives. And that's the first place of interaction with God. There has to be some acknowledgement. I got to acknowledge that my sin is sin. I can't just acknowledge, oh, it's just my way of life. It's just how I roll. It's just what I do. But we need to realize that, that it is what it is for what it is. It's sin. It does not please God. It is outside of the parameters of the word of God, and it does not move us into a right relationship. And then once I acknowledge that, then I need to confess it. And when I acknowledge and confess, then God forgives. And I don't know about you, but I want to be forgiven. I want to live in a consistent, perpetual state of forgiveness with my God. And so David acknowledges that. And then notice what else he says here. He, he says, not only have I acknowledged my sin, that I didn't cover my sin. He said, I confess my transgressions. And because of that, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. In other words, you, you, you forgave the ugliness of my sin. You forgave the wretchedness of my sin. You, you forgave the fact that I planned my sin. Uh, I didn't just fall into it. And, and, and let's be honest, we often plan our sin. We put it on the calendar. You know, we pull up our device and we, we, we electronically put it on day and time. And, and we, or if we don't do that, we have it in our mind that we're going to go out and do something that we know God is not pleased with. 
And so here, David acknowledges that, but he acknowledges the only way to get what I'd like to call divine relief. Say divine relief, somebody. We want to get divine relief, not just in a, 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 a temporal relief. See, see, I can be at odds with you, or you can be at odds with me, and, and, and we can pray together, we can make up, and we can go on. But, but that does not deal with my eternality. That doesn't deal with the fact that I got to be in a right state with God, and so I need to get some divine relief. And that's what David says. He says, in order for that to happen, I, I, I got to go some places where I might not want to go. I, I got to go some places where it might not be comfortable for me to go. But I've got to go some places where I need to go because if I don't go there, I'm not going to get to where I need to get in terms of a right relationship with God. In other words, we need to confess our mess so we can be blessed. We need to confess our mess so we can be blessed. I, I'm going to put it like a very dear friend of mine, Kent Fowler, Pastor Fowler. Uh, he said, we need, to f we need to fess up the mess up so we can be blessed up. I'm giving him credit for that. We need to fess up the mess up so we can get a bless up. And that's what David is talking about here. He's talking about if I want to walk into this new year, in this new season, and walk into it with the blessedness of God, then I need to confess my mess so I can walk in my blessing. And that's why I believe that Solomon said in Proverbs 28, 13th verse, there it says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. It's a process. And it's a multifaceted, methodic process. It's a process that says not only do I acknowledge my sin, but I recognize that I have to go into a confessional posture. And in that confession, what I do is I acknowledge my sin, and then I ask God for forgiveness of my sin. I denounce that sin, and then and only then does God provide the blessing. It's a process. And so he says, I need to confess, I need to renounce, and once I do those things, then I will find mercy. And I know David knew something about that, because as you know, David was that brother who he had good days, he had bad days, he had excellent days, and then he had tragic days. But all in all, David was able to go before the Lord, and that's why he was considered a man after God's own heart. And I believe that there's some folk in the house this morning, you want to be people after God's own heart. And so let's go on, because there in James, the fifth chapter, there when we look at verse 16, this theme of confession continues. There, James says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. And the reason why is so that you may be healed. Healing comes after we confess, after we own up to our condition, our circumstances, and our situations. And not only do we own up to them, then we have to enter into a season of prayer. And beloved, that prayer is significant. Prayer is vital. We can't sidestep prayer. And understand, prayer is not just asking God for things. Because we've gotten into this habit, oh God, give me this. Oh God, I need this. Oh God, I, I, I really need you to, 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 to move on this situation. I, I need you to intervene here. No, prayer is, again, multifaceted. There ought to be some praise in my prayer. There ought to be some adulation in my prayer. There ought to be some celebration in my prayer. There ought to be some acknowledging God for who he is in my prayer. There ought to be some supplication in my prayer. There ought to be some blessedness in my prayer. So my prayer is not just asking, but my prayer is acknowledging and celebrating and praising and recognizing the very majesty of God because he's the only somebody who can answer my prayer. So many times, our lives are 
void because we don't understand the absolute necessities of how we need to go before God, how we need to go in and come out of that private prayer place, of that going behind the veil so that we can access the very blessedness, the presence, and the power of an all-loving and all-gracious God. And I declare, beloved, we need to do that in this new coming year because I'm telling you right now, we're about to face some challenges. We're about to go through some stuff. And we need to be prepared. We need to be propped up. We need to be empowered to be able to walk into the blessedness in the midst of the stuff that we're going to go through. Here, John gets in on the act. The apostle John, and when you look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he gets on this uh, spiritual bandwagon of confession. And he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, I don't know about you. I, I want to be purified of everything I've done. I don't want anything to be left on the table. I want to make sure that when the time comes when I leave this plane and I enter into the very presence of God, I'm going in with a clean slate. And so here John says, if we confess, that has to be the condition. That, in essence, when he says if, really brings it to the place of being a prerequisite. This has to happen if it does happen, if we confess our sin. Oh, and notice he says if we confess our sins. Not if we confess somebody else, because see, we good at that. We good at looking at somebody else and saying they out of order while we not acknowledging the fact that we got a plank in our eye and we trying to deal with the splinter in somebody else's. He said if we confess not somebody else's sin, but if I confess my sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins. And then praise be to God, he says he's going to purify us. That means he's going to cleanse us and not leave any dirt behind. I'm talking about getting even better than borax clean. Y'all remember borax back in the day when they said, if you really want to get clean, you need to get a borax clean. No, if you really want to get clean, you need to get a Holy Spirit clean. You need to get a God clean. You need to get a Christ clean. You need to get a clean from the blood that was from the cross clean. That's the kind of clean that John is talking about. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's what God wants us to understand. And that's how when we look at what the word of God helps us to realize in terms of this process, it is an ongoing and everyday process. And that's why when we get back to the 32nd Psalm and we look at verse 6, notice what it says. It says, therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer. To you a time when you may be found. And here David is talking directly to God. He's saying let everybody, nobody excluded, let everybody who is godly. And there is the spiritual caveat. Those who are godly. Now, if I ask all the godly folk in the house, to raise their hand, how many hands would go up? Come on, let me see the godly folk in the house. That's all right. You can put your hands up. Come on. Because godly folk are those folk who not only love God, but who will surrender themselves to the things of God. That wasn't a trick question. <laughs> That was just for us to acknowledge the fact that if we have given our lives to Jesus Christ, if we say that we are washed by the blood of the Lamb, if we say that we have been imparted with God's Holy Spirit, if we say that we stand on the Word of God, if we say that we walk by the Word of God and we live by the Spirit of God and we move by the power of God, then we are godly. We godly folk. And so here... 
David says that let everyone who is godly. And again, this is that spiritual caveat that John spoke of just a few moments ago. And he says, if you are godly, then there's some things you ought to be about. He said, if you're godly, you ought to offer prayer in a time when prayer ought to be offered. And notice we come full circle because here David once again brings it all the way back to prayer. So you can't get anywhere without prayer. Prayer has to be the staple of our spiritual growth maturation processes. Prayer has to be the foundation. Prayer has to be that place, not just on Sunday mornings at 1015 here at Spirit of New. But it ought to be every single day of the week. Prayer ought to be ongoing. Prayer ought to be something that does not stop. That's why it says the constant prayer of the righteous avail much. And so here he says that this prayer of the godly ought to happen at a time when God can be found. You know when that time is? Now. Now is the time when God can be found. Now is the time before the great trump of God sounds and there won't be any opportunity to find God. The time is now. Uh, not tomorrow. I know t tomorrow, you know, a lot, a lot of us going back to work, you know, we've been off for the holiday, we're getting ready to go back to work and getting ready to go back to school and getting ready to go back to the things that, you know, that we've done before the holidays, you know, we've had this little bit of time off, but, but we're going to go back to things, but before we go back to things, we need to deal with the now. Because the truth of the matter is, and I've told you all this before, that your tomorrow, our tomorrow is not promised. Truth is, the rest of this day is really not promised. You know, we here right now, we here in this moment, but the truth of the matter is, I don't know what's going to happen an hour from now. None of us may be here. We could be ending this service. You can be going home. We can be going home and something happened on your way home and you never make it or I never make it. And y'all be getting a, a, an email or a text blast or, or, or call blast talking about, oh, we need to pray for, for Sister Young because Pastor Young's no longer here. And so, see, we need to realize that we need to pray to God while he can be found. Because we don't know what's going to happen down the road. Sometimes we plan, well, God, I'll pray at night when I lay down before. You know that prayer reason, Lord, I lay me down to sleep. Uh, Lord, bless my soul. You know, we prayed that prayer when we were kids. But the bottom line is, we may not make it to the night. So we need to pray while he can be found. And then notice what else he says. He says... He said, surely in the great rush, or in the great rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. And then he goes on and he says in that seventh and eighth verse, which is our text verse for the morning. I know y'all, some of y'all were wondering, is he ever going to get to the text verse? Here's our text verse for the morning. Verses seven and eight. And look at what David says. He says, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. And then he says, you surround me. With shouts of deliverance. Oh, I hope y'all got a few more minutes so I can work with this thing for a minute. He says, you're a hiding place. And I don't know about, I want a hiding place in God. When stuff get crazy and folks start talking out their head, and all kind of madness starts happening around. Lord, let me find a hiding place. Let me get to a place where I am safe in your arms, where I don't have to deal with all the goofy stuff that's going on, and I can just find a place where I can get some peace and some quiet, and I can huddle around the very throne of God. God, give me a hiding place. And see, that hiding place represents several things. The hiding place represents a place of protection. God, protect me from all the stuff that's going on out there. Protect me from the wiles of the adversary. Protect me from folk who don't know what they're doing, who don't know you and don't want to know you. Lord, protect me. 
place of protection, but it's also a place of fellowship where I can have communion with my God. Oh, God, I'm in my private prayer closet, and I can pray, and I can seek your face, and I can hear your voice, and I can have an ongoing relationship with you, and I can be in oneness with my God. That hiding place. I'm talking about the hiding place. The hiding place. It's not just a place of protection. Praise God it is. It's not just a place of interaction with God. But it's also the hiding place is also a launching place. A launching place because now I've gotten fed. I've gotten strengthened. I've gotten encouraged. I've gotten inspired. I've gotten built up in my spirit. Now I can launch out to do the things that God's called me to do. Oh, I've got some power now because I've had fellowship with the master. Oh, I've got some insight now because I've got fellowship with the master. Oh, I've got discernment. So now I know how to go out and come in. I know when to go. I know when to stay. I know where not to go. I know what not to say because now I've been in my hiding place. See, there's some stuff you're not going to get anywhere else but in your hiding place. And that's why David said that you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. So we need to realize that there are some things in God you're not going to get anywhere else. There are some things in God you're not going to get in your job. You're not going to get in your neighborhood. You're not going to get in sports activities. You're not going to get in your finances. You're not going to get in anything else. You can be in love and have a relationship, but you're not going to have a hiding place that only comes in God. I don't care if you with your boo, your children, your parents. I don't care. You can be with your cousin. You can be with them, whoever them are. You're not going to have a hiding place, but that hiding place that is only in God. It's a launching place. My hiding place is my loving place. I learned how to love in my hiding place. I learned how to really love. I learned how to deal with the folk who deal unjustly with me in my hiding place. Because in my hiding place, God speaks to my heart and shows me how to walk, shows me how to be, shows me how to be a man of integrity or you as a woman of integrity. It's my hiding place. Because all of the other externalities can't invade my hiding place. <laughs> my hiding place, it's my teaching place. Because there's only lessons I'm going to learn in my hiding place I'm not going to get anywhere else. I'm not going to get them in school. I'm not going to get them on my job. I'm not going to get them in my There's my hiding place, that secret place behind the veil. You're not going to get that anywhere else. You're only going to get that when you submit and get into a place when you are face to face with the God of your creation. The God of your salvation. It's my teaching place. And so when I start talking about that hiding place, and David says the hiding place, that's the place where God molds me and shapes me and matures me and grows me and equips me in my hiding place. And understand this, the hiding place is not the place where you stay. It's the place where you hide for a season. You hide there for a season so that when that hiding season is over, you can now burst out of your hiding place and you can go on and do the bidding of God and you can go work the things of God and you can live in the power of God and you can walk in the ways of God and you can do the ministry of God so that you can be about the business of God. See, the hiding place is only for a minute. The hiding place is to equip us so we can come out and go out and do the things that God has equipped us to do. 
But that hiding place never goes anywhere. <laughs> that hiding place is always there. So when I need to retreat back to the hiding place and get built up again and get strengthened up again and get empowered, then I can go back to my hiding place. I'm talking about how to be blessed in this new year. And so notice as we go on, he says in verse 8, he says, I, oh, and oh, and oh. He talks about how you will surround me with these shouts of deliverance. <laughs> He's going to surround me. Every, my, my front, my back, my top, behind me. Because God is speaking to me, because he's pouring into me, because he's counseling me, because he's ministering to me, inside of me there's going to be shouts of deliverance because God has blessed me. He has moved me from a place of being afraid to a place of being able to be bold and to walk out and to do the things that God has called me. There's going to be shouts. Shouts of deliverance, shouts of getting me to where I need to be because with, before I went in my hiding place, I couldn't get there. But now that I'm in my hiding place, the shouts of deliverance are going to be all around me because God is preparing me in a higher level than I've ever had before. I can walk in my, 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 my newness of life and, and I can see that thing that used to hold me bound. Now I've got mastery over that thing. I can shout a deliverance because now I've overcome that situation. That thing that used to cause me problems and used to cause me terror. Now I've got the ability to overcome that thing and now it's no longer a problem for me but I've become a problem for it because now I've got dominion in a way that I've never had that's my shout of deliverance we talk about blessings in a new year in a new season and then he goes on and he says in that verse 8 I'm bringing this thing to a close he says I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way you should go. Now, the only way God's going to be able to teach us is if we posture ourselves, position ourselves so that we can be taught. I got to be in a position where I can learn something from God. And how do I get in that position to learn something from God? I got to go to the hiding place. That's what the hiding place is for. Because in that hiding place is where God teaches me. That's where he shows me things. Because now my heart, my mind, my spirit, my attitude is now opened up to the things of God. Where now I can hear where before I couldn't hear because I wasn't in the hiding place. Uh, are y'all hearing me? I'm talking next level. I'm talking about, you know, all this, uh, I, oh God, I don't know why things are happening. Well, they happen because you're not in a hiding place. I don't see, I'm always going through a hard time. Well, you going through, you get your end in the hiding place. That hiding place is there for a reason. It's there for our protection, and it's there to preserve us. And that hiding place is at the feet of the master. It's at that place where God and you have one-on-one -on -one communion. Nobody's interfering. Nobody's uh, getting in your way. But we have to make that hiding place our place. And then he goes on and he says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way that you ought to go, the way that you should go. Because in that hiding place. God gives divine instruction. You ever hear how the Holy Spirit just speaks to your heart? How he just gives you instruction? How he just ministers to you in the midst of a situation that you're going through and you're trying to figure out, God, what do I do? How do I deal with this thing? And God just said, don't even worry about it. I got that cover here. You just watch me. Now, I should tell you all before, there's times when God will take us toward a closed door and we're trying to figure out, well, God, what am I going to do when I get to the door? Don't worry about what you're going to do. Just get to the door so God can open that door and allow you a way to get through it. See, that's hiding place maturity. And so here he goes on and he says, he says, not only will I instruct you, not only will I teach you, not only will I show you the way that you ought to go, but I will counsel you with 
my eye on you. That means God doesn't take his eye off of you. He knows what you're going through. Not only is he omniscient, not only does he know everything, not only is he omnipresent, he's everywhere at the same time. Not only is he omnipotent, is he all powerful, but God always knows what you're going through because he keeps his loving and divine and protective eye on each and every one of us. And that's cause for celebration right there. If I come into this new year with nothing else, I can praise God because he's got his eye on me each and every day, every moment, every second, every hour of every day. And not only does he have his eye, but he said, I will counsel you. I will show you what to do. Because, see, in this world that we live in, a whole lot of stuff is coming at us, and we don't always know what to do. But praise be to God, he says, not only will I not leave you, will I not forsake you. I've got my eye on you, and I'm going to show you how to get through your situation. I'm going to counsel you because my eye's on you. I see what's getting ready to come tomorrow. You can't see it, but I do. I see what's getting ready to happen on Wednesday morning at 8.35. I, I, I see that you're getting ready to go through that intersection and that car's getting ready to run a red light, but I'm going to watch over you and I'm going to let you be enough, about a minute and a half late because I'm going to keep you. I see that financial toll you're getting ready to go through, but you know what? I'm getting ready to open up windows heaven and I'm going to pour out blessings so much that you won't have room enough to receive it. Why? Because you spent time with me in the hiding place. And so he goes on. Let, let, let me kind of move on. Notice what he says in verse 9. In verse 9, he goes on because he follows up the preceding verses with some, what I would like to call theological perspectives. Some things that help us to understand where God is, where we are, and how we're able to come into oneness in our journey together. Notice what he says in verse 9. He says, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding. See, he's trying to coach us on how to walk in the blessedness of our new season. And he says, do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. You know what he's saying? Basically, he's just saying, you know what? Don't be stubborn. Don't be rebellious. Don't be stiff-necked, hard-headed, and hard-hearted. He said, don't have the attitude like a mule or a horse that I'm just going to go my own way, and the only way I'm going to go the way you want me to go is you're going to have to lead me with a bit or a bridle. In other words, I have to be forced to do what you want me to do. He said, don't be like that. Because if you're like that, you mean you're not being like God. If you're being like that, where you got to be like a horse or a mule, you are stubborn. You decide you're going to do your own thing just because you can do it, just because you may have done it before and got away with it, so you think it's okay. He said, do not be like a horse or a mule with a bit or a bridle. He said, if you do that, it is not going to end well for you. And he's saying, and I, oh, Lord, there were no amens on that. <laughs> but here he says, if you do this, you're doing it out of a sense of being either stubborn, rebellious, stiff-necked, hard-headed, or hard-hearted. He said, you shouldn't have to be led around with a bit or a bridle in your mouth. You ought to know the right thing to do. And why should you know the right thing to do? Because you spent time with me in the hiding place. Because I've counseled you. I've had my eye on you. I've watched over you. I've preserved you. I've kept you safe. I've given you every provision. Why? Because you spent time with me in the hiding place. If you're spending time with me in the hiding place, I shouldn't have to lead you about with a bit and a bridle. He goes on and he says in verse 10. He says, many are the sorrows of the wicked. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. 
You see the differential here? You see what he says? He says, wicked people, which are the opposite of the godly. Remember when I said, let the godly folk put their hands up? The wicked folk are the folk who with willful intent will not go to the hiding place. Will not spend time with God. Will not confess of sin. Will not acknowledge their sin. Will not confess sin one to another so that they can be healed. The wicked are those who have decided. I ain't trying to fool with that stuff. It don't take all that to love God. It don't take all that to be righteous. Well, the truth of the matter is it, it really kind of does. Because when we talk about righteousness... We don't just kind of trip on it. We don't just kind of slip up on it. It is deliberate and definitive. This righteousness is what the scripture talks about, how we ought to pursue it. And so that's why he says that the sorrows of the wicked are many because the wicked think that righteousness is just supposed to come to them. But he says that the sorrows, the pains, the agonies, the anxieties, the frustrations, the worries of the wicked are many. They are multifaceted. They come from a whole bunch of different directions because folk haven't taken time to get to the hiding place. And then he goes on and he says, praise be to God. He says, but the opposite, the antithesis of that, he says, is that steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. And beloved, that, that's our amen right there. Steadfast love and all that that love encompasses surrounds us. Remember how we said a few moments ago how those shouts are all around us? God's steadfast love is all around us. For the one who loves the Lord, for the one who is holy and righteous and who trusts in the Lord. And that's why when he says in verse 11, he says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. See, the unrighteous don't have anything to rejoice about. But he says, you who are righteous, you need to be rejoicing, you need to be glad, and you need to have shouts for joy, all who are upright in heart. And that is cause for celebration. That is cause for adulation. That is cause for acknowledgement of the God who says, I love you so much that I want to bless you day in and day out. And all you have to do is be righteous and you can celebrate my goodness from now until eternity. And beloved, as I get ready to close, I want to talk to you in just a couple minutes about what I'd like to call pursuits. And here what we need to recognize is there are some things that we need to understand. We need to be able to prioritize proper pursuits. Because in our day-to-day, -day, we go about life and we live the way we live and we do what we do and we think what we think and say what we say. But the bottom line is we need to make sure that our pursuits are proper pursuits and not pursuing the things that are outside of the parameter or the boundaries of righteousness. Because, see, our pursuits are consequential. And I've told you this before. Our pursuits based upon what they are and how we pursue them will determine what our outcome is. And if I want to walk through this year in blessedness, then my pursuits need to be prioritized as proper pursuits. What am I talking about? Look at Proverbs chapter 4. There in Proverbs chapter 4, once again, we're hearing from the wonderful voice of Solomon. And here Solomon says in the 25th verse from the ESV version, he says, let your eyes look directly forward. Your gaze be straight before you. In other words, don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Don't get distracted by the things that try to draw your spiritual attention away from the things of kingdom. Because in this world that we live in, and the truth is we're all very visual, and the world and the world system know that we're visual. How do I know that? 
Everybody's got a device. Everybody's got a, got a phone or got an iPad or got some kind of a tablet or got something or, you know, we got our laptops, we got our desktops, we got all, everything is visual. Right now, you're all looking at the screen. We're very visual people. And so because we are visual, what David is saying and what Solomon is saying and what all of these other saints are saying, here Solomon says, let your eyes look directly forward. In other words, look directly to the things of God. Look directly to the things of kingdom. Look to the things of your eternality so that you don't get distracted with the things of temporality. He says, let your gaze be straight before you. In other words, let your eyes be fixed on the things of God. Don't allow yourself to be drawn off to the right. Or to be drawn off to the left. But continue to allow your gaze to be on the things of God. Because when you keep your eyes on kingdom, then kingdom is going to be your end result. He goes on and he talks about this other prioritizing proper pursuits. And he says in Matthew chapter 6. And there in verse 33, our Lord Jesus is speaking to the disciples and to a group there. And he's talking about those things that, that all of us are in need of. All of us have the need for clothes and shelter and food and all those kind of things. And sometimes we get so caught up in pursuing those things. We get so caught up in trying to get the things of the temporal nature that we obscure the things of the eternal nature. And so here he says, Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. If we don't do anything else but lock in on this. If we allow this to be the focal point of our day to day. When we wake up in the morning. And I say, God, I'm going to seek first your kingdom. I'm going to pursue after your righteousness. If we wake up with that on our mind, I'll tell you, it'll be a good day. If we wake up with that on our mind and pursue that, it'll be a good week, a good month, and it will be a blessed 2022 year. If I seek first the kingdom of God, if I seek first the righteousness of God, if I do those things, God said, you know what God is trying to say? He said, if you just seek me, stop seeking the other stuff. He's not saying don't go to work to try to earn an income. He's saying not, he's not saying don't, don't try to do a good job. He's not saying don't show up on time to do what's right and to do it consistently. But he's saying that ought not be the sum total of your pursuit. If you pursue me, God speaking, if you pursue me, my holiness, my righteousness, my goodness, my grace, my mercy, my kindness, my long suffering, my joy, if you pursue me. I'll make sure everything else gets taken care of. But you got to pursue me first. If you pursue me, I'll make sure that you get that paycheck. I'll make sure that your job keeps going on when everybody else done lost theirs. I'll make sure that that promotion that they had slated for somebody else is going to come up with your name on it. I'll make sure that those bills that you can't seem to get ahead of, next thing you know, you're going to look up next month, and you're going to find you got more money than you have month. Where before you had month, before more than money that you had. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to open the doors and the heavens a window and allow you to receive the blessing that you couldn't get on your own. But you got to seek me first. You got to seek me first before your boo. You got to seek me first before your children. And you're trying to slam them with everything, every good thing. And you're just trying to, just, just, you, know, you, you got so many gifts under the tree, you can't even see the tree. You got to pursue me before your job. Because, see, I'm the one that gave you that job. God speaking. I'm the one who opened the door for you, number one, to get it. I'm the one who allowed you to keep it. And I'm the one who allowed you to continue to grow and mature and pursue in that thing. See, the powers that be had your job slated for somebody else. They had somebody else who was supposed to come along and get that job. But you know what? I stepped in. 
and said, no, I want sister so-and-so to have that job. And they couldn't even understand what happened. They looked around and looked around the room and said, well, wait a minute, how did her name get on here? Well, because God stepped in and decided that job was going to be your job because God gave it to you. But you got to seek me first, God says. Because when you seek me, everything else that you're looking for will now fall into place. And then when you look at that next passage, that priority, prioritizing proper pursuits, look at Colossians. And there in the third verse, and this is going to be my last passage here this morning, the third chapter, first verse, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If then, again, the condition, the caveat, the prerequisite, he says, If then you have been raised with Christ, There's a responsibility that comes with that raising. Now, if you've been raised with Christ, you are to seek the things that are above. Where Christ is. Where Christ is now seated at the right hand of God. If if I'm going to walk through this year, then I need to seek the right things. If I'm going to walk through the blessedness of God... I've got to have the things of eternality and the things of spirituality as my priority. I need to make sure I'm seeking the things of kingdom and I'm seeking those things on a consistent basis because when I'm seeking the things of kingdom, God said, I'll give you everything else. But if you seek everything else, you're not going to get it. You got to seek first the things of kingdom. And then if you are risen with Christ, then you ought to seek the things that are above. And the above things are the things of the spirit. The things of righteousness, the things of holiness, the things that are anchored in the word of God, the things that the spirit of God allows us to realize are those priorities of God. And when we pursue the things of God, God said, I will make sure that you are blessed throughout the entire time. And beloved, as we stand on the verge of this brand new year, as we've only stepped into the second day, I declare God wants blessed things for you. He has already ordained and sanctioned them way back in eternity past. And the only way that we're going to be the beneficiaries of them is that we've got to step into those things by pursuing the things of kingdom. Come on and stand to your feet. David said, you're my hiding place. You preserve for me place from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. You instruct me and you teach me the way that I should go because you counsel me because you have your divine eye on my every move. There's someone here this morning You want to walk in the blessedness of God. You have that heart's desire. Because you know that it's God's purpose for you and for your household. And somewhere along the line, Spirit of God has anchored in your spirit that this time for a change. A time to walk in the things that God has ordained for you. And right now, today is that day. This is the very hour that God says, I've got some great things in store for you. The only way that we're able to access and to walk in the fullness of the things of God is to surrender ourselves to the spirit of an all-loving and all-gracious God. And what I'm saying is simply this. If we've not accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, this needs to be the time right now. That's why the scripture says we need to pray to God in a time when he may be found. We need to surrender our lives to Christ in a season while we still have the opportunity to do so. Maybe we've already given our lives to Christ. Maybe we've already accepted. Maybe we are already Christians. We've already given our hearts and our lives to the Lord. And if that's the case, maybe there are some areas where we've kind of gotten off course. But now is that time to rededicate and say, Lord, I'm ready to get back on board with you. And I'm ready to walk in ways that are pleasing before you. This is the day and now is that time. Maybe you've not spent time in your hiding place. 
And God is saying, now I want you to come and have fellowship with me. My hiding place is waiting for you. And I'm now ready to have interaction with you. We're going to take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. And as we go into prayer, those who are with us here in the house, those who are worshiping with us online, maybe you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have not done that, then please make this moment count and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Again, tomorrow is not promised. Don't think I'll wait till next Sunday or I'll wait till some other time. Now is that time. Tomorrow and the rest of this day is not promised. So I ask you to give your life to Jesus Christ. It's easy to do. The only thing you need to do is to pray after me what's called the Lord's Prayer or the Sinner's Prayer, rather. So every head bowed, every eye closed as we get ready to go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've made mistakes. I know that I have not lived in ways that are pleasing before thee. And so right now, Lord, I acknowledge your son, Jesus Christ. I know without any doubt that he is the son of God. I know that he came from heaven, came to earth, went up on the cross, died, shed his precious blood, allowed his body to be broken, gave up his life that I might have life eternal. Lord, not only do I believe that he is the Son of God and that he died on the cross, but I also believe with all my heart that on the third day he rose from the grave with all power in his hands. And Lord, I'm excited about that because that's demonstrative of the fact that when he got up, I also got up out of my grave, my sin place. And now I'm moving into your hiding place. And so, Lord, I confess my sin before you. And I acknowledge my sin, and now I'm asking for forgiveness of my sins. And Lord, when I do that, that means that I'm ready now to turn away from my sins. And I'm ready to pursue you with my whole heart, mind, and soul. Lord, I now know that I can't do it by myself, so Lord, I receive your Holy Spirit who just stepped in my heart right now. And I know that with the Holy Spirit, I can do all things. And I can walk worthy of what you've called me. So, Father, I thank you for my salvation today. I only ask that you continue to empower me, equip me, inspire me, and mature me so that I can walk in ways that honor you from this day forward. And then, Lord, there are some of us in the house, Lord, we're, we're ready to make a rededication. We know that maybe we've fallen, we've made some mistakes along the way. And, Lord, we know that that's just part of the human condition. But we also know that you are a loving and a gracious God. And so, Lord, I come to your throne with heart wide open. And I'm asking, God, that you would forgive me of the things that I've said and done and have thought. But now, Lord, I place myself at your altar so that I can walk in ways. I can walk in renewed ways that are now pleasing before you. Lord, equip me, empower me. Allow me to walk in ways that honor you from this moment forward. And then, Lord, allow me not to just walk on my own behalf, but allow me, Lord, that my life might be a living witness that when other people see me, they see you living in me. And then, Lord, equip me to be able to reach out to somebody else who needs to know you in the free parting of their sins. And, Lord, for all of these things, I offer you my thanks, my praise, and my appreciation. And it's this prayer now that I ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And God bless you. Give God some praise this morning. He is worthy. An awesome God that we serve, and we are so very, very, very thankful. As we come to the close of this worship experience, I so very thank each and every one of you for being with us here in the house. God bless you. And again, a blessed, blessed new year. All of our online worshipers, we thank God for you, and we pray God for you for your presence with us here. Again, remember to join us on next Sunday right here at Spirit of New Ministries at 1015 as we continue to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest 
rule and abide with us both henceforth now and forevermore. And the children of an all-loving and all-wise God said amen. amen. And amen. And God bless you. And again, blessed new year to all of you. Thank you for coming to Spirit of New Ministries. Yes, Yeah.